Introduction to the Shirley Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shirley Letters from California Mines in 1851-52, being a series of twenty-three letters from Dame Shirley, Mrs. Louise Amelia Knapp Smith Clapp, to her sister in Massachusetts and now reprinted from the Pioneer Magazine of 1854 and 55. Introduction Dame Shirley, the writer of these letters, an appreciation, being a paper prepared by Mrs. Mary Viola Tingley Lawrence to be read before a San Francisco Literary Society on Mrs. Louise Amelia Knapp Smith Clapp, Dame Shirley. The Shirley letters, written in the pioneer days of 1851 and 1852, were hailed throughout the country as the first-born of California literature. Mrs. Clapp, their author, was the one woman who depicted that era of romantic life, dipping her pen into a rich personal experience, and writing with a clarity and beauty born of an alert, comprehensive mind, and a rare sense of refinement and character. The letters had been written to a loved sister in the East— but Ferdinand C. Ewer, a littérateur of San Francisco, a close friend, fell upon them by chance, and, realizing their historic value, urged that they be published in the Pioneer, of which he was editor. These Shirley letters, thus published, brought the new West to the wandering East, and showed to those who had not made the venture the courage, the fervor, the beauty, the great-heartedness that made up life in the new El Dorado. Shirley's sympathetic interpretation of their tumultuous experience cheered the Argonauts by throwing before their eyes the drama in which they were unconsciously the swashbuckling, the tragic, or the romantic actors, and helped to crystallize the growing love for the new land, which love turned fortune and adventure-seekers into home-makers and empire-builders. This quickly recognized author became the leader of the first salon the Golden West ever knew, and one of the foremost influences in California's social and intellectual life, by force of a high intelligence, and a heart and soul that were a noble woman's. Louise Amelia Knapp Smith Clapp came to light in Elizabeth, New Jersey, in 1819. Her father, Moses Smith, was a man of high scholarly attainment, and by her mother, Lois Lee, she could claim an equally gifted ancestry, and a close kinship with Julia Ward Howe. As a young girl, together with several brothers and sisters, she was left parentless, but there was a comfortable estate, and a faithful guardian, the Honorable Osmond Baker, a member of Congress, I believe, who saw to it that they received the very best mental and physical training. Shirley was educated at Amherst and Charlestown, Massachusetts, and at Amherst was the family home. At that day the epistolary art was a finished accomplishment, and in childhood she evidenced a ready use of the quill pen. Later on she maintained correspondence with brilliant minds, who challenged her to her best. At the same time she was pursuing her English studies, to which were added French, German, and Italian. She had but little time for the trivial social amenities, but her frequent missives from her relatives, the Lees and Wards of New York City and Boston, and her enjoyable visits to their gay homes, broke the strain of mental grind, and kept her in touch with the fashionable world. Her communications in the forties disclose a relation to men and women of culture, whose letters are colorful of people, places, and events, and through them we reach an intimate inside of her own self. Those faded, musty-smelling epistles, with pressed flowers, from an old attic, reveal a rich kind of distinct and charming personalities. Shirley, small, fair, and golden-haired, was not physically strong, and her careful guardian often ordered a change of climate. Sometimes she sojourned in the south. In her migrations she might employ a carriage, or venture on a canal-boat, but usually the stagecoach carried her. It was one of those bits of travel that she met Mr. A. H. Everett of Massachusetts, a brother of Edward Everett, a noted author, and popular throughout the country as a lecturer. He had been charge d'affaires in the Netherlands, and a minister to Spain. An intimate relationship, chiefly by correspondence, was established between this gifted girl and this brilliant gentleman. His long letters from Louisiana sometimes were written wholly in French. From Washington, D.C., he writes that the mission of the United States minister to a foreign court has been offered him, 
but it fails to tempt him away from his life of letters. However, later on, it comes about that he accepts the mission of the United States Commissioner to the more alluring China, and his long letters to her from there, as they had been from other foreign lands, were most entertaining. This rare man grows to be very fond of his young and brilliant correspondent, and signs himself, Yours faithfully and affectionately. But he was well on in years, and she looks upon him more as a father than as a suitor, and he so understands it. He commits himself enough to say how much it would be to him to have him near her as an attaché, and when she hints of her engagement to a young physician, he jealously begs to know every detail concerning the happy man. Shirley married Dr. Fayette Clapp, and in 1849, with the spirit of romance and the fire of enthusiasm, the joyful young Argonauts set sail for California in the good ship Manila. They found the primitive San Francisco enthralling, but a fire swept away the new city, and tent life was accepted as one of many picturesque experiences. Soon, however, the doctor's shingle was again hung out. Quickly buildings went up, and the little lady with the golden curls to her waist went about, jostling the motley crowd of people, and finding concern in the active city front, in the gaudy shops, and in the open faro-banks with their exposed piles of nuggets, and bags of gold-dust freshly dug from the earth. There was the ever beckoning to the hills of treasure, and with their extravagant stories of adventure, but the professional man was anchored in the more prosy city, and buckled down to a commonplace existence. The exhilarating ozone from the ocean, the wind blowing over the vast area of sand, the red flannel-shirted miner recklessly dumping out sacks of gold-dust with which to pay his board-bill or to buy a pair of boots, with maybe a nugget for Dr. Clapp when he eased a trivial pain. All these thrills were calls to the gold-filled Mother Earth. Finally Dr. Clapp's ill health drove him to the Feather River, a high altitude, fifty miles from the summit of the Sierra Nevada, and the highest point of gold-diggings. There he soon recovered, and to her joy he wrote to his wife to join him, and she had varying experiences in transit to the prospective home, which was at Rich Bar, rich indeed, where a miner unearthed thirty-three pounds of gold in eight days, and others panned out fifteen hundred dollars in one wash of dirt. The sojourn at the gold camp in the summers and winters of 1851 and 1852, with its tremendous and varied incidents and experiences, was a compelling call to Shirley's facile pen. Here was her mine. Out of her brain, out of her soul, out of her heart of gold, out of the wealth of understanding of and love for her fellow man, gratefully sprang those Shirley letters that have enriched the fields of letters, and, reaching beyond the grasp of worldly gain, have set her enduringly in the hearts of mankind. Who can tell how far-reaching and inspiring were those illuminating pages, those vividly depicted scenes enacted on the crowded stages of the golden-lined bars of the famous Feather River? Bret Hart reads her graphic and pathetic account of the fallen woman and the desperate men being driven out of camp, and, lo, we have the gripping tale of the outcasts of Poker Flat, and from another of her recitals came the inspiration that set him to work on that entertaining story, The Luck of Roaring Camp, and her incidental mention of the pet frog hopping on the bar of the hotel in the midst of a group of onlooking miners. Was it the setting for Mark Twain's jumping frog of Calaveras? During their sojourn at rich and Indian bars, Shirley and her husband became rich in experience. They folded their tent and left with depleted purse, but they had righteously invested their God-bestowed talents. There they had freely given the best of themselves, they were leaving the imperishable impress of high ideals. Upon their return to San Francisco the couple rejoined delightful friends, and established a home. But reverses of fortune came, and Shirley found it necessary to put her accomplishments to the practical purpose of gaining a livelihood. By the advice of her friend, Ferdinand C. Ewer, she entered the San Francisco Public School Department, where for long years she taught, notably in the high schools. Shirley was small in build, with a thin face and a finely shaped head. Her limbs were perfect in symmetry. As a girl, doubtless she had claim to a delicate beauty. She now showed the wear and tear of her mountain experience, coupled with an accumulation of heart-breaking trouble. She gave prodigally of all her gifts. She interpreted life and its arts to all discerning pupils, and by the magic of her friendly intercourse won their confidence. 
Quick to discover any unusual promise in a pupil, she indefatigably and masterfully stirred up such a one to his or her best, sometimes with remarks of approval, or by censuring recreancy with stinging sarcasm, or with expressions of despair over infirmity of purpose. Some of such scholars, notably among them Charles Warren Stoddard, panned out gold in the field of letters. Many of her pupils, including myself, absorbed much of her wonderful help, and it grew into our subconsciousness and became a part of us. She was the long-time friend of Bret Hart, and from her he gathered a wealth of knowledge that served him well. When Mr. Ewer was ordained in Grace Episcopal Church, San Francisco, Shirley became a member of his parish, and together with his wife she assisted him in the ministrations of good. Then this dependable friend, Dr. Ewer, was discovered, with the result that he was called to a church in New York at a salary of ten thousand dollars a year. In addition to her daily teaching, Shirley, by request, established evening classes in art and literature, for men and women, and once a week she held her salon, drawing the best minds about her. She appreciated the privilege of having a home in Mr. John Sweat's family, because of its intellectual atmosphere. Here scholarly notables from near and far were entertained, among them Emerson, Agassiz, and Julia Ward Howe. Childless, Shirley took her niece, Genevieve Stebbins, and reared her from babyhood to a splendid womanhood. She contributed freely to entertainments for charity, by her Shakespearean readings and other recitations, and happily prepared whole parties for private theatricals. With such mental strain she kept herself fit by Saturday outings, in which were graciously included some of her pupils. At times we went across the bay in various directions, but oftenest we strove through the sand to the ocean beach, stopping here and there to botanize, and gather the sweet yellow and purple lupin, and to rest on the limbs of the scrub oaks. On the beach we roasted potatoes and made coffee, and then ate ravenously. A happy gypsying it was, and she, the queen, forgot her cares. Not a pebble at our feet, nor a floating seaweed, nor a shell, nor a seal on the rock, but opened up an instructive talk from our teacher, or started Charlie Stoddard reciting a poem, or set a girl singing. Before starting homeward, the whole party, including Shirley, shoes and stockings off, waded into the surf, and afterwards rested on the warm beds of sand. A fine comradeship, that and one that never died. Shirley, I should also mention, wrote some respectable poetry. I have fondly preserved, treasured, and cherished the original manuscript of a poem written by her at the time Margaret Fuller O'Soli was lost by shipwreck in 1850. This poem was included in my collection of California poetry, but was not printed in outcroppings. I append it to this paper, of which it can hardly be considered an essential part. I married and went to the mines, and our home was on the Mariposa Grant. We lived on a bed of gold. Once, upon a visit to the city, I found Shirley nervous and worn. Her vacation was about to begin. She went home with me, and stayed in bed the first three days. Then she was daily swung in a hammock under an oak. Soon we had horseback rides, and up the creek she again panned out gold. Later we set out in the stagecoach for the hotel at the big Mariposa Grove. Mr. Lawrence put us in charge of Mr. Galen Clark, a rare scholar, and the guardian of the Big Tree Grove and of the Yosemite Valley. This charming man was much interested in Shirley. From the hotel we took daily rides with him through the great forest, and then made the twenty-five-mile horseback ride and found Mr. James Hutchings, of the Illustrated California Magazine, awaiting us at the entrance to the valley. He escorted us to his picturesque hotel, where he and his interesting wife made our three weeks' stay most delightful. Down in the meadows we came upon John Muir sawing logs. He dropped his work, and we three went botanizing, and soon were learning all about the valley's formation as he entrancingly talked. We met many tourists of distinction, and surely forgot that she ever had a care, and on our way back she galloped along recklessly. At our home in Mariposa we invited friends to come and enjoy Shirley's Shakespearean readings, chiefly comedy. In these Mr. Lawrence had a happy part. In time Shirley went to New York, to her niece, Genevieve Stebbins, who was successful in a delightful line of artwork. Before leaving San Francisco her faithful pupils and other friends gave a musicale, and realized about two thousand dollars, which was presented to her as a loving gift.
In the great metropolis her genius was recognized soon after her arrival, and she was importuned to give lectures on art and literature. The Field family, who delightedly discovered her, took her to Europe, where she visited all the art galleries, a treat that had been a lifelong heart's desire. In New York she at once made her home with Dr. Ewer's widow and children, but in the end she went to Morristown, New Jersey, where, it was said, she again happily met and renewed her friendship with Bret Hart's accomplished and delightful wife and her attractive children, while Bret Hart himself was sojourning in Europe, a successful author. Mrs. John F. Swift, her long-time appreciative friend, Charlie Stoddard, myself, and others, contributed to her pleasure by letters till the close of her perfect life at Morristown, New Jersey, on February 9, 1906. No other woman has left a more lasting impress on the California community. But back to Rich Bar, back to the gold fields, Dame Shirley is abroad, and again she is weaving her wizard spell. End of the introduction. Recorded by Rachel Allen, Mariposa, California. December 2007.